The man who fought for peace. He was a man of the left who was respected on the right. Gunned down in his prime. It was the murder of a hero and a grandfather. The assassination of Yitzhak Rabin 20 years later. And then. He said, there's been a little accident up at the farm. A young man clings to life. My son was dying. While his parents cling to prayer. We had nowhere to go but just pray to God. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The pastors of Houston, Texas, pulled off a major win yesterday as they shot down the so-called gay rights ordinance that was proposed by the lesbian mayor of the city. They got the issue put on the ballot by, you know, the leadership, but the voters soundly rejected the measure yesterday. Opponents said it would have trampled on religious liberty and allowed men in women's bathrooms. The defeat is a big blow for gay rights activists. They spent millions to get it passed, and they got endorsements from Hillary Clinton and companies like Apple. Heather Sells has the story. Houstonians have strongly rejected the ordinance with more than 60% voting against it. It's one of those moments in time that you stand up and say enough is enough is enough. A diverse coalition of city pastors opposed the ordinance. Its non-discrimination language on gender identity would have allowed men in women's bathrooms. Equally concerning, what it would have meant for Christian business owners opposed to same-sex marriage. That baker is going to have to bake a cake for the same-sex couple. We're talking about an ordinance that will criminalize, will put someone in jail or, or force them to lose a business just because of their faith. Local pastors have been fighting the ordinance for more than 18 months. When the city council first approved it, the pastors organized a signature drive to put the issue on the ballot. The city's lesbian mayor then declared the signatures invalid and subpoenaed the pastor's sermons when they sued the city. Every battle was like the intention of the city hall just to uh, quiet the people's voice down and, and intimidate and, and, and show themselves to be the stronger, most powerful force in the city. But the Texas Supreme Court overruled the city and ordered the measure to go on the ballot so the people could vote. It's a crushing a defeat right for Mayor Anise Parker she rallied support for the ordinance from the president, Hillary Clinton, and corporate giants like Apple. Her allies raised millions, outspending opponents roughly three to one. It's also a major loss for gay rights activists nationally, as outside sources poured in close to $3 million to support the measure. Voter turnout may have made the difference. Early voting numbers doubled compared to the last local election. Heather Sell, CBN News. You ever think you're going to live in a country where there's a law being proposed that would <clears throat> force men to be able to use women's bathrooms and women to use men's bathrooms? Who ever heard of such nonsense? Things are already confusing enough. Well, I think I mean, that would hey, just uh, make yeah. it so much worse. Well, the people of Houston got better sense than <laughs> my hat, if I had a hat, is off to them. <laughs> All right. Well, in other news, he ran as a political outsider and a Christian. Now he's the new governor of the state of Kentucky. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Ephraim. Pat, Matt Bevin is also only the second Republican to win the governorship of Kentucky in four decades. Bevins is an outsider who's been at odds with state party leaders for challenging Senator Mitch McConnell in 2014. Bevin appealed to voters by talking about his Christian faith, his military service, and his family. He has four adopted children from Ethiopia. He also supported Rowan County Clerk Kim Davis's refusal to issue same-sex marriage licenses. His running mate, Janine Hampton, will become the first African-American to hold statewide office in Kentucky. Bevin called on Republicans and Democrats to work together moving ahead. I want us tonight to go out of here inspired to unite. I challenge each of you tonight to find somebody as you go about your business tomorrow, somebody who you know was on the other side of this particular battle, this particular political equation, and reach out to them. Extend your hand, literally, figuratively, whatever the case might be, that we are only going to be the greatest version of ourselves if, in fact, we are one Kentucky. 
Republicans also control the state Senate. Democrats have an eight seat majority in the House. Kentucky clerk Kim Davis is appealing the court orders that ultimately sent her to jail for refusing to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Davis's attorneys filed a request with the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, asking the court to reverse four lower court rulings, including the one that held her in contempt. The 126-page filing calls the district court judge's order a, quote, rush to judgment that trampled the clerk's religious liberty. The Rowan County clerk spent five nights in jail in September for defying the judge's order. Despite government efforts for years, airport security is still failing. The Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security told Congress there are still problems with the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, at, quote, every airport. It is the latest report to find difficulties with the TSA. A previous investigation found people could get fake explosives and weapons past security. Although the Inspector General said the TSA is making progress to improve security, one Republican Congressman, John Micah of Florida, said he's convinced the system cannot be fixed. Pat? Well, I think it would be fixed if they fired about two-thirds of those people. It was just, it was a make-work project that was set up, and uh, they just loaded up the uh, roles with people who didn't have a lot of qualifications. Some do, but a lot of them don't. And it's just become a circus. I was reading the other day where there was a 90-year-old woman. They, they forced her to take off her blouse and her brassiere. Uh, I mean, what kind of an indignity is that in the United States of America? But that's yeah. TSA. I mean, and they, they, they do strange, bizarre things, and yet people that are carrying explosives and plastic and all the rest of it are able to go through without any problem. People are, you know, grandmothers have to take off their shoes, and oh, it's just a, it's a nightmare. The Israelis know how to do it. They know how to, uh, well, of course, in America, that would be called profiling, but they do profile. They know who would be a potential terrorist. They have it in advance, and when those people show up, uh, then they get a thorough screening, but the rest of the innocent pastors, uh, passengers go through without being molested. But not so in America. And as I say, let's start. As I told you, those guys, the TSA sounds for thousands standing around. And that's all they're doing is wasting money. Fire them. Ephraim. Pat, the U.S. national debt shot up by more than $300 billion in one day Monday, the same day President Obama signed a bill that suspended the ceiling on the federal debt. The Washington Examiner points out the increase is part of an increasingly common pattern where the amount of the U.S. debt jumps whenever the debt ceiling is reached. For example, the debt jumped up by $100 billion in just nine days after the debt ceiling was lifted in 2012. And in 2013, the national debt jumped by $300 billion in one day after the ceiling was suspended. An Arizona high school football player given a one-game suspension after giving thanks to God after scoring a touchdown will be allowed to play in his next game. The Arizona Interscholastic Association overturned the penalty against Pedro Banda after reviewing the video. They said pointing his finger to the sky and looking upward did not constitute excessive celebration. Banda said he always does this. The official ejected Banda because he'd already been penalized once for unsportsmanlike conduct. The team's next contest is a playoff game, the school's first in two decades. Pat? <coughs> wow. That official again. You know, I'm for firing some people. Let's face it. I mean, whoever. You know, you see the pros all the time. A guy scores a touchdown, he holds his hand up kind of like I'm giving credit to God. I mean, yes, that is his expression. That is a religious expression, like God's number one. You put your finger up to heaven. I mean, you're going to throw a man out, a, a player out, and give him a suspension because he does that? That's an unreasonable celebration. Give me a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, here again, you know, these officials, they ought to be trained better. And the one, I mean, they overturned him on happy days, but it should never have happened. And uh, it's just one more example of the religious freedom of people being circumscribed by people who don't know any better. Evram? 
Pat, a growing number of Americans are using prescription drugs these days. A new study finds 59% of adults take at least one prescription in the years of 2011 and 2012. That is up significantly since 2000. The drugs include antidepressants and those for diabetes and high cholesterol. About 15% of Americans are using five or more prescription drugs. Researchers say there's no one reason for the increase in drug use, pointing to factors like obesity, the aging of America and other concerns. Well, drugs don't seem to be the reason why some Americans stay so healthy in their old age. A group of scientists is studying the so-called super agers, people who keep their minds and bodies healthy as they grow old. Keeping connections with others is seem to, seems to help, and some of healthy senior citizens say it's important to keep busy, to keep working, and to stay active. One expert tells Agency France Press that geriatricians she knows say that if you could put exercise in a pill, it would be the most sought after drug on the market. Pat? Yeah, I like that pill stuff. But anyhow, uh, what does it? Well, I tell you, stay young. You do a TV show with a lovely co host. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you are the youngest 85 year old that I know. Well, <laughs> it's in your mind. It really is. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think, oh, I've got so much stuff going on. And I mean, you know, I was up at, I mean, I woke up at three this morning thinking of one particular transaction. I called my secretary at about seven. I said, look, can you take a memo? I've got well, something. Well, and you're a passionate person. You're passionate yeah, about many yeah. things. And I think that that, you know, the Bible says without a vision, without a passion that you die. And that doesn't matter how old you are. You can be young and, you know, feel well, like you're old. We, we're into all kinds of things here and it, it's good. So, I mean, hey, get yourself a talk show on TV, folks, and you'll, you'll live to be a hundred. But don't, don't you think exercise what? really is the fountain of youth in, in well, some it is. regards? They say walking now does you more good. And of course, riding a horse is great too. So whatever, <laughs> but I, I do, I do some exercise and, uh, you know, some weight. Uh, you know, I, I used to do a lot of weights and heavy, heavy, heavy weights, and I don't do them anymore. But I mean, I was—I used to warm up leg presses at 500 pounds. I mean, I'd warm up with 500 pounds and go up from there. And and I, yeah, I used to have all kinds of stuff, but I'm not yeah. doing as much of that. But uh, anyhow. Well, you're still an inspiration to all of well, us. I want to be an inspiration. <laughs> all right. Hey, we've got something coming up, Wendy. I had the privilege of interviewing Yitzhak Rabin, and it was 30-some years ago. We're going to show a part of that interview, but anyhow, you got the story. That's right. Up next, the Israeli prime minister who wanted to give peace a chance and was murdered because of it. Rabin was genuinely loved in Israel, but even at the time of his death, many Israelis thought that his bold action towards peace was a mistake. We'll look back at the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin and Pat's interview 20 years ago. Well, the officer in the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, that actually stormed the um, Temple Mount and liberated the, uh, that area of Jerusalem, uh, was then a general. Uh, in the army. He became chief of staff, then prime minister. And this week, uh, Israelis marked the 20th anniversary of the assassination of their uh, war hero and prime minister Yitzhak Rabin. I had the privilege of talking to Rabin uh, about 10 or 15 years before his death about his view on peace, the Arabs, and a lot of other things. It was a fascinating time. I interviewed him on Christmas Day. I believe it was 19, well, I don't even remember the, the it was, it was 74, I think. Uh, Chris Mitchell brings us this look at how Rabin is being remembered in Israel. Saturday evening, November 4th, 1995, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin had just sung Shir La Shalom, the song for peace, along with some 100,000 Israelis in Tel Aviv. He was a man of the left who was respected on the right, he was a man who was cautious, who made bold decisions. Shortly afterward, a Jewish extremist gunned down the prime minister. It was not just a political assassination. It was the murder of a hero and a grandfather. Rabin is buried here in Mount Herzl Cemetery in Jerusalem. Many Israelis come here to honor his legacy. His murder stunned the nation and the world. Leaders from some 40 countries travel here to Jerusalem for Rabin's funeral. Though we no longer hear his deep and booming voice, it is he who has brought us together again here in word, 
and need for peace. A few years earlier, Rabin told CBN founder Pat Robertson, Israel must remain strong in the face of threats. Does it seem as if Syria, uh, possibly any of the other Arab states, might want to move into some kind of a jihad against Jerusalem, against Israel, or, or is that likely? I was born here in Jerusalem. I fought in the two wars that decided the fate of Jerusalem to become the capital of the state of Israel. And I believe that they'll never be able to fulfill what they try to achieve as long as we'll keep our powder dry, our belief unshaken, and we'll have the patience to do what our heritage, religion, call us to do. Michael Widlansky, author of Battle for Our Minds, says the problems of today closely resemble those from decades ago. Some of the world's leaders don't interpret events correctly. Rabin was genuinely loved in Israel, but even at the time of his death, many Israelis thought that his bold action towards peace was a mistake. In 1993, Rabin and PLO chairman Yasser Arafat's representatives signed the Declaration of Principles in the presence of U.S. President Bill Clinton on the White House lawn. The agreement with the Palestine Liberation Organization did several things. First of all, it saved the Palestine Liberation Organization. The second thing is it brought in an era of terror unmatched in Israel's history. And the third thing is it taught Israelis that to build peace required more than just hoping for peace. It meant building security. In 1975, 18 years before Prime Minister Rabin shook Arafat's hand, he told Robertson that while superpowers could play a role in Arab-Israeli peacemaking, they could not replace the parties themselves. Any peace negotiations have to start on the assumption that the purpose of the exercise, the purpose of the negotiations is to make peace and to make peace between whom? Between the Arab countries and Israel. Prime Minister, if the um Arab countries are not truly willing to accept peace negotiations with Israel. Do you feel that the efforts of the superpowers, either the United States or Russia, will bring anything good towards peace? I think that the, the major powers can create conditions, can create the environment mm -hmm. that would lead the Arab countries on one hand and Israel on the other hand to make peace. But the peacemaking is the responsibility of the parties to the conflict. In 1979, Israel signed its first peace treaty with Egypt, and in 1994, its second treaty with Jordan. Both agreements have held for decades, despite ups and downs. The peace agreements that Israel made proved several things. First, Israel wants peace. Secondly, Israel can make peace with real countries when there are real joint interests. But third, Israel should not try to make peace with make-believe organizations, of make-believe minorities, with make-believe national movements. During a rally marking the 20th anniversary, former President Bill Clinton urged Israelis to finish Rabin's legacy of refusing to give up his peace dream, even in the face of terror. Whenever there was a terrible incident here, and I would call him, he simply repeated, what we in the White House came to know as Rabin's Law. We will fight terror as if there were no negotiations, but we will negotiate as if there were no terror. But Widlansky says if Rabin were alive today, he would likely rethink the so-called Rabin's Law. I think he would be very disappointed with his own endeavor and would say Israel has to rely upon itself, upon God, and upon its own better judgment to survive and to thrive. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Mount Herzl Cemetery, Jerusalem. You know, I look back over history, and uh, I did look a little younger in those days. Didn't okay, a little baby, baby face, face going on yeah. back in 1975. It was Christmas mm. Day. Yeah. Uh, of course, Israel didn't observe Christmas, and so they, everything was going, and I, I got an interview with him and uh, went to his office, and I, I, I remember distinctly, I, I said, 
if you have a message to give to the American people, what will that message be, Mr. Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. And he looked sort of sad because he was terribly sad. They were, they were cut off by the Arabs. The Arab oil embargo was making oil prices up and people were, uh, you know, the world was against Israel, so it seemed. And what he said uh, echoes through the uh, ages. He, he said, be strong, be strong. That was his message, that what he wanted America to do was to be strong. And you know, I got, uh, one day I, it was a very moving moment. We had a, I had a group with me of uh, pilgrims that were there in, in, a, in a visit to Israel. And we were staying at the Intercontinental Hotel on the Mount of Olives, and it overlooked the uh, old city, the Dome of the Rock, and all that stuff. And I was up there, and big picture wonders, and this group was there, and I told them about my meeting that I just had with the Prime Minister, mm. and I made a vow, and I said, uh, for me and those organizations that I head, mm. uh, we make this vow, we will stand with Israel uh, and the Jewish people, regardless of the consequences. And 30-some uh, years later, I've kept that vow, and uh, mm. uh, it's been very moving, and the Israelis know of my love and, and support for their causes. and. Uh, I want peace, and that's what he said. He said, what, what we want is a peace treaty, but the major powers won't let us have a peace treaty. We win at war, and they take peace treaty away from us. But we have to have a peace treaty. So in any event, a man of peace cut down uh, by an extremist. Uh, and in any event, uh, I was there. You and were there. Uh, and made that vow, and the Bible says, "Those who bless well, Israel shall Lord be blessed." Well, the Lord has blessed us beyond measure mm -hmm. for for supporting His people. Okay. Well, up next, a car crash leaves one passenger with a two percent chance of survival, and that's if he's lucky. Well, that just like devastated us, and now we learn that he may never wake up, and if he wakes up, he might not have any brain function. Watch him defy the doctors and make a full recovery. That's next. Well, how can you describe what happened to Grace and Kirby? Just use the words said by his doctors, the local news media, and even Steve Harvey. That word, miraculous. And you're about to see why. Growing up on a farm, Grace and Wayne Kirby of Studley, Virginia, has always felt at home on a tractor. But he prefers things that move a bit faster. He's always had to have a motor, okay? He always had to have something operating with wheels on it, okay? Uh, if it moves, he wants to be on it. He wants to push it to the limit. The night of June 7, 2014, 30-year-old Grayson was riding with a friend when they started doing donuts in an open field. They hit a rut and flipped over, throwing Grayson out of the car. His friend escaped with minor injuries and called Grayson's parents, but he didn't give them much to go on. He said, uh, there's been a little accident up at the farm and Grayson's been hurt. He's yes. been med flighted to UVA and they want you and your wife to get here. And as we were getting ready to uh, uh, go out into the garage to get in the car, there's a chair that sits right by the kitchen door. And as she was passing by me, I reached out and grabbed her and I sat on my knee and I said, I said, I don't know what this is all about, but I said, it's not good. And I said, we need to pray. We need to turn it over to God before we hit the road. At the hospital, they learned that Grayson had suffered major head trauma. He also had numerous broken bones and damaged organs, including two collapsed lungs. They say doctors gave him less than a 2% chance of living. To see my son laying there, so swollen, uh, almost unrecognizable, tubes in all parts of his body, I was in shock. As a mother, you want to fix it. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't do anything. My son was dying, and we had nowhere to go but to our knees and just pray to God. Doctors put Grayson on life support. By this time, friends and family were coming to show their support and pray. They also got the word out through social media. Grayson's oxygen level started to improve. Doctors took him off life support and put him into a medically induced coma. Everyone was hopeful, until an MRI showed he'd had several strokes and a brain hemorrhage. I'll never forget the resident's face. He couldn't even look at us. He was looking at the floor when he was talking to us. He said, if Grayson ever wakes up, it's gonna be closer to the two month 
time period, and we can't tell you what will be there. And I remember asking him, you mean he could be a vegetable? Well, that just like devastated us. I mean, we, we'd gotten our hopes up to this point that he was improving. And now we learned that he may never wake up. And if he wakes up, he might not have any brain function. So once again, I, I prayed to God and I could just hear him saying, Karen, I've got this. Have I not proven myself to you in this amount of time? I've got this, it's gonna be okay. Four days passed with no sign of improvement. Then the Wednesday after Father's Day, Wayne got the best gift a dad could hope for. It started with a text message from his wife. The text message said, get in here quick. He moved and Grayson looked at me when I walked into the room and he, he, he couldn't talk, he could, but he could, you could read his lips and he mouthed the words, I love you. And just, it was just the most overwhelming. I could feel my knees getting weak. I just thought I was gonna have to go sit down. And I just, I looked back at him and I said, I love you too, son. After Grayson woke up, we realized that that God was in control. And it didn't matter what the doctor said to us, God is the master physician. And it was going to be his will that was going to be done. Within hours, Grayson mouthed the correct answers to every question hospital staff asked. And the doctors would come in the room and they would look and they would say, it was almost like, I wasn't expecting this. And we're sitting over the other side of the room saying, we did, we did. That's what we've been praying for. Grayson was soon on his way to recovery. Things just kept getting better, progressing every day. I went from not being able to stand to being able to stand for three seconds to walk in with crutches. After two months of rehab, Grayson was cleared to go home. He's so much back to his normal self and it just warms my heart every day and I thank God constantly, constantly. Thank you, God. Thank you for sparing my son. Today, Grayson shows no evidence of ever having a brain injury and is back to work on his family's farm. He still has scars and wears a brace on his left leg, but those are just reminders of God's grace and mercy. It speaks in volume um, as, as to how much he loves me and how much he cares for me. He answers prayer, he hears our prayers, and if we believe in what we're praying for and we believe in him, he will answer us. Whatever situation that you're confronted with, God is in control of it. He's got it. God does miracles, and He still does them today. And if He did it for Grayson, don't you think He'll do it for you too? You know, I love the fact that God fixes things that we can't fix. That's why it's called a miracle. Well, we have some praise reports. Yeah. Pat May of Taunton, Massachusetts, okay. suffered with chronic pain in her left leg. She could hardly walk or stand. One day, May was watching the 700 Club when she heard you, Pat, give a word of knowledge saying you have terrible and chronic pain in your left leg. It's like a deep vein thrombosis. May stood up and immediately the pain left her leg. It was the first time in over a month that she was pain free. Praise the Lord. You know, I don't know May in Taunton, <laughs> Massachusetts, but God does. Mm. And God knows you wherever you are, whatever part of the world you happen to be in right now. God knows you. He knows your name. He knows your situation. Here's somebody named Annie. She lived in Lake Wales, Florida, and she suffered with a foot fungus. It resembled chicken pox. She tried different medications, nothing worked. One day she was watching this program and Wendy gave a word, you have a problem with fungus on your feet. God's touching you. And he looked down and guess what? The feet were completely clear of anything. <laughs> did you know Annie? I sure didn't. And You've I remember, I remember Annie getting that Lake word. Annie in Wales, Florida. <laughs> he didn't know it. I mean, I, I didn't know this guy in Taunton. God knows everybody. You see, he's, there's nothing impossible with God. And Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. There's nothing impossible with him. The only thing that's impossible, he won't deny himself. Other than that, uh, he can do anything and will, because he loves you. Now, Wendy and I are going to join hands. We're going to agree with you wherever you are. And I ask you just to do one thing. I ask you to pray with us. Father, I join with my sister in Christ. In the name of Jesus, yes. we pray together now for people. Somebody's got a nervous tick. It's the tick in your, your uh, jumping thing in your, in your face. They used to call them tick de la rue. Uh, and, and just put your hand on that right now, and it's, it's healed in the name of Jesus. Wendy? 
Many people have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue and it's causing depression to sit, set in. And God is saying you have the authority to take that, cast that spirit out. And when you do, uh, God says that you're going to feel completely recovered. No symptoms of fatigue or depression in Jesus' name. There's a neck pain. Uh, you've got a bulging uh, muscle. That you pull a muscle in your neck. Just reach out and touch it. That, that swelling has gone down. As you speak and touch the word, it, touch your neck right now in Jesus' name. Wendy, what else? Someone with a swollen tongue, very painful, very hard to swallow. God is touching you right now and taking away the fear, and you're going to feel completely better in Jesus' name. Night sweats are being mm -hmm. healed. And all over this audience, the, there's a spirit of, of sadness, and God is lifting that spirit of sadness. Yes. You don't have to be sad. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, and the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God right now that passes understanding is coming into your life, and I speak peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Oh, God's good. Okay, amen. what do you got? All right. Still ahead, he dreamed about becoming the next great music producer, but God had some different plans. It was one of the most authoritative times I've ever heard the voice of the Lord speak to me and say, James, I want your life. Hear how this former drummer is encouraging people today when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. While America is becoming more secularized, Americans who embrace religion are keeping their faith. A Pew Research Center survey finds that 77% of American adults who identify with a faith group are staying engaged with their faith. Two thirds of them say faith is very important to them and they pray daily. About 60% say they attend worship services at least once or twice a month. And others say they regularly read scripture, participate in small prayer or study groups, and share their faith with others. Israeli forces raided a Palestinian radio station earlier this week. The military says the station was inciting violence in the West Bank. The Israeli forces entered the Al Haraya station in Hebron and confiscated equipment that was being used to call for attacks against Israelis. Eleven Israelis have been killed by Palestinians in recent weeks, mostly in stabbing attacks. The military says the radio station has encouraged stabbings and glorified the attackers. About 70 Palestinians have also died in the recent violence. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. You know, I've got some good news from Reason University. Uh, one of our uh, trustees is a very distinguished trial lawyer in Texas. And he said, what you need to have is a degree in wealth management. So uh, we followed his advice and got the people in the law school together. And they are announcing that they're making available to students a course, a master's degree in wealth management. And here's what you could do once you get it. You could be a certified financial planner. You can be a wealth management advisor. You could be a financial advisor. You can be a trust officer, an investment manager. And you can have access to industries, including investments, insurance, and real estate. Now, this is from, you'll have uh, the ab ability to sit for the uh, uh, certified financial planner exam. You can get a degree of uh, certified financial planners if you pass their board, and you can sit for it after you finish this. And uh, this is going to give somebody a fabulous background, because not only will you have the financial part of it, but you'll also have the legal part of it. So you can talk knowledgeably about real estate. You can talk about the stock market. You can talk about all these things. So uh, that'll be nice. So if you're interested, the number's on your screen. And tell them you're interested in the law school, Regent Law School, master's program in financial planning, hmm. wealth management. I, I wish I needed a wealth management lawyer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For all those millions you have. Yes, need. maybe one day. One day. <laughs> one day you'll have enough money to need a wealth manager. Okay. <laughs> well, Regent University just began the fall session with its largest ever enrollment. 
and those students will hope to join the 20,000 graduates making an impact around the world. And those alumni include actors, congressmen, judges, and a former jazz musician who's breaking down racial barriers. Take a look at this. James Ward had no doubt about what to do with his life. I had done very well with performance and music. Um, I also had a strong business acumen. I understood the, the, the corporate side of music, the industry side. And that was my interpret that was my my you know my goal for myself that I was going to be the, the next Quincy Jones or the next David Foster, the ne next great you know music producer. By age 22, he was well on his way. A talented drummer, he and his jazz band were on the road. One night, the plan changed abruptly. And I'll never forget, I was in Boston. You know, we had just finished this show um, with a band that I was touring with, and um, interactive people were around having drinks and having cigars. And I, and I hear within myself the voice of the Lord, and there was no question about who it was, but it was, it was one of the most authoritative times I've ever heard the voice of the Lord speak to me and say, James, I want your life. James had professed faith in Christ as a boy, but wandered from God in college. He decided it was time to put God first. You know, the lifestyle of, of drinking and smoking and having different girlfriends, all of those things had to change. And, and for me, I'm, I had to change some numbers and to remove myself from, a, from an environment that would cause me to stumble. James walked away from music. He found a church and was mentored in his faith. Later, he married and also sensed a call to be a pastor. In 2008, he enrolled in Regent University for theological training. It's been one of the greatest, greatest uh, decisions I've made in my life. I was just simply overwhelmed with the, the depth of, of understanding and intellectual thinking, the depth of uh, passionate theology. You know, I was already involved in full-time ministry when I went to Regent University, but I found that, that Regent enriched and enhanced what I already knew. You know, if medical doctors have to train to the highest degree to give their best services, why wouldn't pastors and preachers also stretch themselves intellectually uh, to, to, pri to provide the very best ministry that they possibly could to God's people. Today, James is the pastor of Insight Church near Chicago. In 2014, he wrote Zero Victim, which reflects his passion to help others succeed by overcoming a victim mentality. I define victim mentality as a, as a conditioned mind uh, that sees itself as the victim of the uh, injustices or the negative thoughts words or, or actions of other people. The idea stemmed from his experience growing up in Tuscaloosa, where many blamed others for their circumstances. I grew up on the south side of the city, which was typically known as the black side of town. It was just this understanding that um, white people were somewhat not for you, and a lot of the challenges that we were experiencing was because of white people. So when James was bused to a new school in third grade, he thought at best he'd face discrimination. At worst, he'd get beaten up. But instead, he thrived. The zero victim mentality, it begins to control the world within you. And that is the only way to really uh, bring about the racial harmony, the gender harmony, the ethnic, ethnic harmony uh, that we really need in our nation. James says the ultimate example is Jesus Christ. I marvel at this idea that the only innocent man that ever walked on the face of the planet, he suffered the greatest injustice that anyone has ever suffered being crucified, not for his sins, but for someone else's sins. And so I really think that the zero victim mentality is the mentality of Christ himself, and uh, it's what, uh, what America needs in this hour. It's a great time for the church to shine. It's a great time for the gospel to be preached and to, prevent, for, to present the solutions that are in the Word of God that can only solve the challenges that we're facing as a nation. That great. I'm glad to show some of the uh, alumni of Regent University, and James is one of them. We have some very distinguished guys, and this man is out uh, in the, yeah, well, the forefront of the gospel in a great church in Chicago. Anyhow, we're training people. The idea is Christian leadership to change the world. We have seven college presidents who graduated from Regent. Uh, we have 30-some sitting judges who are graduate from Regent. We have all kinds of people who are in politics. 
as graduates of Regent and businessmen. And I'm like, well, it's fun to see. Okay, Wendy, what's next? Well, you can hear more from James Ward by getting his book. It's called, again, Zero Victim, and it's available nationwide. Well, still ahead, it's time to bring it on with your email questions. Anne says, I allowed my unsaved daughter and her boyfriend to move in with me in hopes that I could be a positive Christian influence on them. I think it's working, but my sister says I'm participating in their sin. Am I? Pat will tackle that and more when we return. Introducing CBN Selah, a brand new Christian instrumental station from CBN Radio. Listen now at CBNRadio.com. One of the hardest things for any parent is seeing your child suffer and not being able to help. That was the case for one mother in Honduras who had no money for the operation her daughter desperately needed. Judy was desperate to find a cure for her daughter's crossed eyes, which she'd had since birth. My grandma told me to hang a red doll over Astrid's bed and said, that will cure her. When the couple finally saved enough to take Astrid to the doctor, they learned that the only remedy was surgery. I am a bricklayer's helper. I barely earn enough for food. Judy took her daughter to the hospital eight times to see if someone would do the surgery for free. The answer was always no. As the months went by, Astrid began to fall and bump into things. Her mother was convinced it was because of her crossed eyes. I remember the day she fell and hit her head hard. I threw what I had in my hands and ran to pick her up. Then one day, Operation Blessing sent a medical clinic to their village. We then arranged for Astrid to have surgery. When Judy asked how much everything would cost, we told her it would all be free. A short time later, a surgeon repaired the weak muscle in Astrid's left eye. The next day, he examined her and confirmed the operation was a success. My daughter looks beautiful and I am happy because she is healthy. Things have changed for the better for Astrid and her parents couldn't be happier. Thanks, Operation Blessing, for changing the course of my daughter's life. Oh. Isn't she beautiful now? You know, there's a joy that comes when we help others that really can't compare to any other joy. And, and we make it easy for you to experience that here at CBN uh, just by going to your phone, 1-800-759-0700, and saying, yes, I'd like to be a member. I'd like to join with the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And you can change lives. You can change families. You can change generations of, of lives just by... Uh, just by saying yes, and we want to do that for you today. And when you do, we've got a gift for you. It's called The Transforming Word. This is Pat's dynamic new teaching, verses to overcome fear and experience the peace of God. This is fantastic teaching that we want you to have uh, when you give us a call. And it is now time to bring it Let's on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, Ann says, after months of prayer, and I believe through the leading of the Lord, I allowed my unsaved daughter and her boyfriend to live in my home. I'm a 75-year-old widow. I felt that under my influence, I could win them to the Lord. She now has Bible study and prayer with me and my other children, and I believe the Lord is beginning to move. My problem is my sister. She's saved. She told me I'm a sinner for allowing this, and until I make things right with the Lord, she cannot pray with me or have any spiritual contact. What's your take on this? Uh, I think your sister is a Pharisee and Pharisees don't see what God is doing. You prayed and perceived the way to win your daughter was to be loving and accepting. Now, a lot of people wouldn't want to do that. It looks like you're enabling them to live in sin, uh, and what they're doing is cohabiting without marriage, and that's a no-no. But your sister should get her hands off the deal and see that what you're doing is working and this is the way to win your daughter. So don't worry about what your sister says. You worry about what God told you and you're doing what God said, all right? Amen. Well, Mike says, is Islam the hammer of judgment on the wickedness of America? I continually ask, ask God to protect the U.S. from evil and delay his judgment, but eventually is it inevitable? No, no I, you know, the judgment is never in inevitable. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah uh, 
uh, didn't have to be that. God said, if I find 10 righteous in the city, I'll spare it. So uh, it didn't have to, but he couldn't find 10 righteous. And those men wanted to have sex with angels. I mean, how bad can you get? And the judgment finally fell. America is teeter teetering on the balance. You know, uh, we have forsaken the covenant of God. We've done abominations. We have exported abomination around the world. But at the same time, we're still the beacon of freedom. We're still the sending uh, ground of the great missionary movement of the world. And so God actually loves America. So judgment is not inevitable, but there's some things on the horizon that don't look too good. And if we don't repent, some stuff is going to happen that we won't like at all. All right, Doreen says, I want to be part of a harvest of blessings. I want to know what it means from the Bible and what I have to do to benefit from it. Well, <laughs> harvest of blessings. Harvest. Well, <laughs> what you need to do to get a blessing is to follow the laws of the Lord, do what He tells you to do. And the biggest thing is to love each other and don't say bad things about people. You know, love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another. And if you want to be blessed, you take away the pointing of the finger, you take away slander, you take away a bad report, and you start loving people. And then you start doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And you put those rules into effect, and all of a sudden, blessing will come. In terms of finances given, it'll be given unto you, pressed down, good measure, running over, the Lord will heap into your bosom. So as you're giving from your resources, you'll begin to see a tremendous uh, outpouring of uh, finances. All right? Amen. Chris says, the Old Testament is full of great warriors. Christians are being targeted and threatened daily and are attacked regularly. Why is there no modern day army of God Christians? Is it because Jesus brought a new covenant in the New Testament or are we Christians just weak and scared? Uh, well, we, we definitely are, are they're great heroes of the faith. I mean, one of my dear friends is Reinhard Bonnke. I mean, he's leading millions to the Lord around the world. And uh, they're, they're people who are going forth in the name of the Lord who are doing tremendous things. I, th I think what you see throughout CBN is not too shabby. But, uh, you know, the Bible talks about uh, he slayed them with the sword which came out of his mouth. The Word of God. We don't take up weapons like swords, but the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God which is in our mouth. And we speak the Word, and the Word will transform people's lives. Okay. Last All question. right, Beth says, hello, Pat, my name is Beth, and I'm a Christian. However, I enjoy a glass of wine on occasion with my dinner. I don't drink anything other than wine, and only rarely. Is it wrong to enjoy a glass of wine sometimes with my meals? I really want to do what is right in the sight of God. Well, uh, if it's wrong, then Jesus is the prince of sinners, because he transformed water into wine. And the Bible says that God blesses us he gives us oil to make our faces shine and wine to gladden our heart. And I think the Bible also says wine is a mocker. So you drink too much and you've gotten problems. But a glass of wine with your food, I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. But, you know, it's a, <laughs> whatever. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> yeah, well, not exactly. <laughs> right. We leave you with the power of minute from Psalm 34. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>